after I'd finished Monty Python, I'd always wanted to do something with Connie. And I was invited out by a lovely man called Jimmy Gilbert, um, still a, a, a good friend, and he was the producer-director of The Frost Report. And I always really liked him and very, very much respected him. And he'd been made head of light entertainment. So we went and had lunch in a restaurant called The Gun Room, which is now Chibo in Holland Park. Lovely restaurant. And um, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to do something with Connie. And he said, all right, well, why don't you just go back home and talk to Connie? Give me a call and tell me what you'd like to do. So I said, well, it's lovely. Thank you, Jimmy. And I went back and sat down with Connie. And for about 20 minutes, we discussed whether we could do a sort of man, woman, Nichols and May kind of thing. And then we thought, well, no, because John Bird and John Fortune and Eleanor Braun have done it and done it much too well. And then, then one of us said to the other, well, what about that hotel we stayed in? And within 10 minutes, uh, we we'd agreed that was what we were going to do. We rang Jimmy, and Jimmy said, OK, you want to do a half-hour set in a hotel? That's fine. We'll write a pilot. This is wonderful. You know, it was so relaxed, he trusted us to write it. He was so gratuitously rude, because like all British hoteliers, he operated on the principle that I could run this hotel properly if it wasn't for the guests. You know, and if he behaved badly, it was rude, it was the guest's fault. You know what I mean? Because they were these awkward people who would come up and ask questions and complain about things. And he would sit at his desk and uh, staring into space, and the moment he saw someone coming, he would pretend to be busy. He'd pick up a pencil and start doing all this stuff. Because I watched him once. And he does this, you see. And, and, and then he would pretend he didn't even know you were there. And you'd have to stand there for ages thinking, does he know I'm there? And then he'd say, excuse me. He'd say, oh, what? <laughs> oh, what? What is it now? <laughs> And uh, I remember one occasion I said to him, could you call me a taxi? He said, what? I said, could you, could you call me a taxi? Said, he said, call you a taxi? And I said, yes, could you? He said, oh, yes, fine, yes, leave it to me, I'll do it. <laughs> so there was this extraordinary rude and grudging attitude towards the guest. Now, he was quite small physically, and Mrs. Sinclair was sizable. So it was more obviously the sort of hen-pecked husband situation by reversing it, because I couldn't be small, obviously, and Prue is not very tall. We kind of took it away a little bit from the more obvious aspects of, uh, of the hen-pecked husband. But he went on and on in this way, and we did kind of garner material. I mean, oh, i tell you one extraordinary thing. Eric... Um, one day, Eric and I were waiting for the car to take us filming, and Eric left his briefcase uh, by the door where he'd propped it up while we were just playing catch with a tennis ball. And when he got back, he went up to the desk and Sinclair saw him coming. <laughs> Excuse me, what? What is it now? He said, I'd left the, uh, my briefcase. He said, yes, yes, he said, it's the other side of the wall. And he pointed out of the out of the front door, uh, to a white wall, which is the far side of a swimming pool. And he said, it's behind the wall. <laughs> and Eric said, what? He said, what? He said, what? He said, it's behind the wall. He said, yes, yes, I'll put it behind the wall. Eric said, well, why did you, why did you put it, what? Why did you put it behind the, behind the wall? He said, we thought it might be a bomb. And we're back. <laughs> Bomb, and Sinclair said, "Well, we've had a lot of staff problems recently." So he really thought somebody had fired, and come back, put a bomb in a briefcase. <laughs> when we did the second show, the Builders show, I was very thrown by how little laughter there was coming. I, and, you, you know, a part of your mind is registering it, but you're pushing it out of consciousness because you have to perform. 
So you don't want to start thinking, oh, gosh, this isn't going very well. I wonder why they're not laughing because you're hardly going to be doing the lines well. So I pushed it out of my mind. But afterwards, I went up and I said, well, why, do, why weren't they laughing? And nobody knew. Some people said, well, it wasn't a bad reaction. I said, it was nothing like the first program. What? And then I discovered later that the BBC ticket unit had had a large group of people meeting, uh, arriving from Icelandic television who wanted to see a comedy show. And they'd been nice enough to choose Faulty Towers as their victim. So apparently the first four rows of the audience were Icelanders. I remember there was a faint smell of cod coming, which I couldn't explain. But you see, stereotypical jokes, disgraceful. <laughs> shouldn't do that. Uh, but I, you know, that was the reason. The dear old BBC ticket unit were much more interested in giving the Icelanders a good evening out than they were in providing the right environment for what was, after all, merely another program. <laughs> Well, the, we were quite skilled physically. I mean, Andrew and I were both reasonably skilled at that kind of physical humor. I mean, when you watch Keaton and Chaplin, I mean, they are breathtaking physically. They can do things I couldn't even attempt. But by contemporary standards, Andrew and I were pretty skilled, and we'd had a lot of practice. That's where experience helps. So far as the studio audience were concerned, I used to say to actors at the very, very beginning, I said, my theory is, this is my theory and what it is, uh, that people in, laugh much more in groups than they do if they're on their own or with one other person. I said, therefore, we want to play this comedy much faster because people are not watching it in groups. They're watching it at home with one or two other people. So let's play it as fast as we can. And I said, now the key here is we have this thing called a microphone. So you do not have to wait for the audience to stop laughing for the audience at home to hear what's being said. So I said, the microphone's there. It'll pick you up. Plow on. Don't wait for the audience because that'll slow you down too much and then it'll be funny for the audience here, but it won't be funny for the audience at home. And the actors had to get used to this a little bit. They said, really not wait for the laugh. I said, wait a fraction, but keep the pace up. This is all about keeping the pace up. You can't do it on stage. All you can do on stage if you've got the audience laughing is you can add visual gags because they can see those. But if you've got a funny line, then you have to wait for them get quiet and that can slow things up and that's why often Saturday night although the audience is laughing a lot in theatre it's not as good a performance because it gets a little slow because the laughs is too long I always loved the scene with twitching because I thought you know the embarrassment that one faces when you've forgotten someone's name. It's so awful because you know that to some people it really, really matters. But it's funny. You see, most people think, most people think that he faints because he's forgotten Twitch's name. He's, most people don't get the fact that he faints because he doesn't want to say Twitch it to someone who's been doing that throughout the episode. So it's very nice that people get that. But I think there's something terribly funny about the desperation. <laughs> The way you can get out is by fainting. And I think the fate was good, but in the middle of it, you go for it. Because the moment you hold back in physical comedy, the moment you hold back, it's a disaster. In Fish Called Wanda, when uh, Kevin, I had the coat over my head, and Kevin Klein hit me on the head with the, with the uh, bedpan, uh, we thought we'd got it, and I took the thing off, and I said to the first director, did he really hit me? And the first director's lovely guy, Jonathan Benson, said, yeah, he really. I said, okay, do it again. Uh, because you've got to go for it. You've absolutely got to go for it. And when Prue is hitting uh, O'Reilly with the umbrella, where they stuff the umbrella. Which is why it doesn't look like a proper umbrella. I didn't know they'd stuff the umbrella. They did that in the break before the show. So, so, um, and she's too nice, Prue. She didn't quite hit him hard enough. You know what? You've got to go for it because the moment the audience realizes you're holding back or faking it, it's no longer funny. Well, John had just, I think, been quite captivated by this character, and he called and asked me to come down and have a look. 
And um, I don't, I remember seeing him, but it was the stories that became famous about him, which are fairly well known. You know, the first one was, I think, Eric Idle had left his suitcase in the lobby and Donald Sinclair moved it around to the back behind the garden shed because they thought it had a bomb in it. And then uh, there was another incident at, after the meal in the dining room when he came over to Terry Gilliam and he rearranged the cutlery on Terry's plate saying this is how we do it in our country. So th those were the two stories that came to mind. So yes, that was uh, in the atmosphere so that when Jimmy Gilbert approached John about doing his own series. John wanted to do something based on Donald Sinclair. And uh, we'd done a bit of writing together, and by then, and so he asked me if I wanted to have a go with him at writing a pilot. But I have to say that even though it had been uh, two years since he'd met Sinclair, that uh, Sinclair had really taken seed in John's mind and um, I think he knew that he as Sinclair was going to create havoc in this provincial hotel and that he wanted me as the wife actress to be a kind of ballast uh, to hold him in check, a bit like Polly or like Sybil. I was keen to work with John and we'd enjoyed the bit of writing that we'd done together. Um, John was, where I was, I think, I mean, I never had any, he trusted my instincts as an actress, and I, so I, I didn't have any problems with saying what I didn't think was funny. No, I don't believe that. Why does he say that? What John was able to help me with, I think, was coming forward and creating ideas. Um, I remember when we, uh, and he did make me laugh a lot. You know, we had some terrific moments, and there was another in the, uh, just thinking sort of how we played, what I call played together with an idea, uh, in, in um, Basil the Rat. We knew that we needed a rat, but to have a rat arrive when the inspector arrived would be too contrived. So I thought, well, Manuel might have a pet rat that was sold to him as a hamster. And John said, uh, a Siberian filigree hamster. And later I thought, hmm, that works so neatly, but did that idea come from the parrot sketch? You know, how, where do these, these ideas come from? And another time when we were really stuck for an idea was um, with um, the, the wedding party. And it's when the... Um, the tension's building, the sexual tension with Basil, particularly because he thinks, and she is, Mrs. Penwar is flirting with him. And Sybil is out. Mrs. Penwar comes and knocks on the door, Basil's door, to get a morning call. She leaves. Sybil arrives and knocks on the door. And Basil panics and thinks it's Mrs. Penwar who's come back for him. <laughs> And he tells her to go away. You see, she keeps knocking and the tension keeps spelling, go away, you stupid woman, or whatever he says. Then it, he clocks it that it's Sybil. And this transition, how are we going to make that moment work when he sees, opens the door to Sybil? And we couldn't get it. And it was, God bless him, John Howard Davies, who said, oh, what a terrible dream. And that was brilliant because it was so Basil, you know, it's wonderful. Well, you know, again, I guess it, I think the fact that we were husband and wife, that, you know, there aren't many places you can't go. And John really could make me laugh. And when we got into something, I mean, we loved uh, Akebourne and uh, Nichols and May, and there were things that we just, I don't know, we just felt on the same page with. So, as I said, because John had the reputation he had, and he was who he was, and I could somehow, um, maybe it's like being with a parent, you know, you can, you can trust, they can handle it, and then you can 
start to be. Um, because it's, it was somewhere I think, I didn't think that consciously, but I thought it's his responsibility. And he was great because he's, he's like the python, you know, he is irreverent and he is tough. And he would say to me, you know, because there was this thing about the BBC sitcom TV, you know. And, um, he, you know, he'd say, you know, it doesn't matter. Just go with it. Just come on. Just play. Well, someone I thought really smartly d described her as the Laertes of the piece, you know, as in Hamlet. He who is the sanity at the center with all this chaos madness. And I, and I, th I think she serves that purpose. She's, she's not a comedian. I'm not a comedian. Oh, I, I, I think it's such a fascinating character. Um, I think, I don't think Basil can be played, even with, with John's comedic greatness. I don't, if he'd been an average size, I don't think he could have pulled Basil off. Because I think there's something about his height um, and what he does with his height, almost as if it's operated by remote control. There's, which gives it a kind of detachment. But that, plus his passion, you know, his desperation, his um, huge scope for um, longing, anger, and of course his fury. And because of what John can do with his body, you know, he's a bit like Alice in Wonderland in some way, you know, that he can, change shape and change size and but he couldn't do that unless he had the height um, and John's timing and John's facility for language he was such a contradiction in his way wasn't he he you knew how clever he was and yet he could be so daft I often wonder why the show is so successful after all these years. Uh, I took, it took three months, the whole thing, the whole two series took three months out of my working life of over 60 years now, which was very varied in theatre and radio particularly. And uh, I'd done a certain amount of television, but not that much. Uh, and I was uh, playing the lead in a, in a farce in town when it was suggested uh, from, by John, John Cleese, whom I knew. I'd worked for him for Video Arts, the company he had, making uh, training films for, for businessmen and so on. And uh, he approached me and uh, s asked me if I would, he's, he's he and Connie had written this uh, series, six episodes, and he rather thought I might like to play the Spanish waiter. I thought, well, that's very nice. I've never been in a, in a ser full series, comedy series before. I'd done individual shows. And uh, so I thought, that's rather nice. And uh, he told me about the character, and the, uh, already made difficulties then, because I said, yeah, that's all very well. I'm not sure I can do a Spanish accent. Can you do it, can I do it as a German waiter? Because German is my first language, in fact. And he said, um, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine Manuel as a German waiter that the hotel would be a total success, wouldn't it? I thought it was brilliant writing. And while we were making it, even the first series, I, uh, I had good feelings about it, as everybody did. But I'd had nothing to compare it with. So I asked uh, one of the cameramen on the shooting day, uh, who had done a lot of comedy series, thought I'd get his take on it, and asked him, you know, you've done a lot of this kind of stuff. What do you think of this? Is this a good one we're doing? He said, yeah, just like that. I thought, oh. Oh, that's nice to know that, you know, it gives you a bit of confidence. And it turned out to be just more than what he said. And it's bewilderingly successful. And so, as a result of it, not only was the, was the series so successful, um, Manuel became dreadfully famous all over the world. But not Andrew Sachs. Andrew Sachs is unknown, and I like that. The energy he has, he puts into it, the comic invention, the timing and so on, 
and it was a real privilege to work with him because most of my w stuff was with him and we worked well together and he was immensely strong so he could lift me up in no problem and he could drop me as well in no problem for me because I'd done that kind of stuff before uh, so it worked well as a team and that was in the whole company it was such a good family company you know you become a bit of a family professionally while you're working and rehearsing and it seemed to me to be very open to suggestions from anybody we had um, for instance uh, at that time when we were rehearsing uh, halfway through the morning, halfway through the rehearsal, uh, the, the coffee lady, tea lady, would come in with buns and coffee on a trolley in those days, and she'd wait, wait patiently until the end of the section we were doing and watching, and uh, then we'd break for coffee. And I noticed that once or twice, John Howard Davis, the director, Bob Spears in the second series, and John Cleese would be always be interested in what other people were thinking at the company particularly and it even stretched as far as this, this coffee lady uh, if there was a funny joke going on a gag uh, the eyes of some of the staff production staff would look towards us did she laugh yes okay okay yeah good it's nice to get that confirmation so they were very open-minded the whole uh, the whole crew and company we I think we all, without, without any, uh, anybody not, we all uh, were, a te were a team. We did Jim will fix it, for instance. I was asked, some little girl wrote and asked, she wanted to teach, teach Manuel English, something like that. And so we worked it out, and I did that uh, in the uniform, in everything, all the costume and everything. She, she thought I was a Spanish waiter. And then I taught her how to make breakfast and lay it all on that. It was lovely. It was really nice. And the, the, the image of it wasn't destroyed for her. I think it must have been afterwards when I took the makeup off and she probably looked, oh, terribly disappointed, I don't know. That sort of thing went on. I mean, sometimes it got a bit boring. But if it was something like a Jim will fix it or similar things on... Oh, i tell you what I used to do, which is terribly popular. Uh, they used to ask me to go in, on these busi big business conferences as Manuel and disrupt the proceedings so the president of IBM or wherever would be talking about you've got to sell more, more of you know, this, that, and the other uh, uh, to this big gathering, maybe in foreign lands, in Madrid, for instance. I did one in Barcelona. Uh, very serious because it's, it's rewards for, them, for the employees and so on. And I would come in... the president, this was pre rehearse I got hold of the president or vice president, whoever he was, and we worked out a little thing that I would come on as Manuel. And he would go into his speech, and suddenly at the back of the hall, back of this venue where it was, uh, I would come in at the back and I'd say, stop, stop, saying you're no, it's, it's no, it's not for you, it's private, it's only for IBM people, please, you go please, out of the way, please, you go now, please, it's finished, bye bye, to the president, you see. <laughs> So they loved all that. They hooted. That went terribly well. She grew up in the business. Her parents had, I think, a, a, a boarding house probably in, in Eastbourne perhaps, and so she grew up in, in the business. And... Um, I think uh, they met when Basil was, had been demobbed after his national service. And with his demob money, he was going for a drink. And he, he, he met her in a bar, and she was behind the bar, and she fell for him because he was posh and, and, and quite attractive, for goodness sake. And he, he fell for her because, because she was quite sort of... Um, attractive in a kind of, uh, I don't know, magazine-type way, perhaps, and um, also that she knew the business. And uh, I think they probably married quickly and uh, repented at leisure. At the time, you don't think of whether it's fun or not. You think, 
can I manage this next quick change? What's the next line? Um, oh, Lord, are we going to be able to do a retake on that? You don't think about, you know, uh, whether it's fun or not. It's a, it's a, a professional job that ne needs to be completed as, as well and as, as efficiently as possible. I mean, I don't, I, do you know any actors who said, um, oh, you know, it was... I mean, y yes, of, of course. It was. I don't look. I look back on it with great affection and and uh, in, enjoyment. I mean, I don't think. Oh my God, that was a ghastly job. I think it was. It was a lovely job, and uh, and uh, one and, and made many enduring friends from it. But um, on the whole, you 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 don't you don't think like that as an actor, you know. I mean, if if it's a really ghastly job where where it was a. Uh, or turned out to be a terrible play, and, uh, and it came off after two nights. You think, oh dear, oh no. but um, uh, on the whole, you just you just think think back on on this particular one. You uh, very grateful to it. The repeats come in very very handy too. It's a a, a brilliant. Um, comedic script which occasionally pushes over into broad slapstick comedy, beautifully written and beautifully executed. And so um, things like beating, beating the car uh, are, are, are high spots. And that's... Um, and then moments when the other sort of touching moments are when you realise that She's very attached to him, and they don't want to break up. I mean, the, 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 all, but all the well, I I'm tired of hearing myself saying all the best comedy is based on pain, from Pratt falls on in, and um, so the painful moments, either comedic or touching, are, are, are moments that one treasures really. On the set of the day of the studio, we were showing it to a new audience, the camera crew, the sound crew, and everybody else, the dressers and s scene shifters and so on and so forth. And they laughed too, which enabled us to, to gain confidence. And to f we always used to do a couple of run-throughs in the afternoon, uh, which I insisted upon. And we looked forward to the show. We may not have looked forward to it in the sense that we, our nerves were shattered by then, but it, it's not like facing the firing squad. Uh, it's something else. It's, it's like going on stage in the theatre. You're filled with apprehension and nerves, but, and you want to get it over with, but you enjoy the process. And that's the process that I felt very much at Forty Towers, probably more than most other programmes I've done, simply because of the excitement it generated. You didn't go to sleep immediately after the show, that's for sure. I never had any problem about the length of the scripts, which were very much longer than the average situation comedy, uh, because I knew it was going to be transmitted on BBC Two, and that we had a kind of open-ended time frame. Some of them ran 34, 35 minutes, some rather less, but they were, in one sense, commercially untransmittable because they run usually at about 22 and a half minutes. But it never seemed to me a, a problem because I always believe that you cannot do comedy fast enough and I always optimistically hoped that it would run to time. It never did, of course. But I didn't mind because the impetus, once it started, was so strong, uh, it was very difficult to stop it. I mean, we went to the studio once without a tag and made it up on the spot. There was that kind of frenetic energy that enabled us to do things that in a normally constructed situation comedy with its quiet moments, it would have been both impractical and wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have had the dynamic. In the, the, the far uh, episode of, or scene, uh, I insisted on trying out everything in the, in the first run through in the afternoon. And we set him a light in the kitchen and he burnt rather well. 
and his back got burnt, his arms got burnt. He was in some pain. And he was terribly brave about it because he said, you know, I've a bit of pain. I've got first degree burns. All oh, yeah, all right. Yes, get on with it. Then we did the second run. We didn't use fire or flames in that. And then we did the show. And afterwards, he was in some considerable pain. But he did complain to me, sort of backhanded way. He said, oh, that, that really hurt, you know, in the kitchen. Well, I said, we've got a good laugh. <laughs> We have a kind of British tradition that the best comics are usually villains as well. That doesn't really apply to Basil because he's vulnerable as well. He's, he's endearing in many ways and he replicates very well some of our uh, innermost emotions. He gets very angry quite a lot of the time and yet he's very, very frightened of Sybil. So he can't win. He's on a hiding to nothing before he starts but it's intriguingly complex. And people have come out with great theories about what makes him tick and why. Actually, it doesn't matter a damn. It's no good analyzing everything and suggesting that there must be a reason for the way that Basil behaves. That's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to make people laugh. The reason why it makes people laugh is a question that's often been asked, uh, but seriously, it's not a question that's easily answerable. Things are either funny or they're not. It's one of the few things that made me laugh from the beginning to the end. I read the scripts in bed and fell out of bed laughing, and I was laughing at the last day of rehearsals and the last day of production. In the early 80s, I was working over in Texas at the Houston Opera House. We were doing My Fair Lady there, and uh, I was playing Doolittle. And I'd had a call to go onto the stage, left my dressing room, was walking along a corridor, past one of the crew rooms, and there were gales of laughter coming out of this room. And as I walked by, a very tall, gangly Texan came out and said, Hey, I've just been watching you on TV with that faulty guy. And they were all watching my episode, which was wonderful. And they were roaring in there. <laughs> Very funny piece, I must say. But um, painful and funny, the, the bit where John is um, trying to shut me up when I'm shouting and screaming in the, in the restaurant. And uh, I think in rehearsals, I had to ask him to refrain from karate chopping me quite so vehemently because uh, he's a big, powerful man, you know. And he was a young, big, powerful man then. And I was, gee, well, hang on, son, hang on. You know, pull it, act it, right? But uh, very enjoyable, a lot of fun. I never saw in, in my episode John ever, uh, outwardly to me, be exasperated or lose his temper or not be in control. I saw this perfectionist which I found kind of exhilarating and wonderful, you know, that he, he knew what was right, he knew what he'd had in his head, and he knew how it should be put together. And he, if nobody else spotted it, he would direct. I mean, I, I, I did a bit in A Fish Called Wanda, which John, he got the wonderful Charlie Crichton, the great, great comedy director, back. But John did half the directing in that, you know, and he knew, I mean, John knows his comedy backwards, or certainly did in those days, you know, and, and he, he didn't, he only, su he supported the other actors to get it right. I mean, there have been hideous directors in the past who will destroy actors in their determination to get something right and actually won't achieve anything. John was wonderfully supportive. John genuinely laughed when things worked for other people, you know, all that. I never, I never saw him do anything that wasn't supportive and creative and terrific. Yes, it was quite anarchic. It, it broke a lot of rules, I think, at the time. Um, there was nothing like it on at all. I mean, everything was fairly uh, formula-type sitcom, I think, at the time. And that's why it was so unique, because John Cleese's 
his character of Basil, there was no, I don't think there's anybody ever been on television <laughs> since, you know. The fact he was so rude and awful, he was sort of an anti-hero, which made it very refreshing and, and very funny. And, and it went into such farce. Again, most sitcoms were, um, it was based in a situation and you had your funny lines, but he, he, again, he broke boundaries. It was so farcical. In nearly every episode, and I don't remember all 12 brilliantly, but nearly every episode, he, he goes off on into another <laughs> world. <laughs> I Certainly the, the episode I did with the rat was, um, especially the rat popping up in the biscuit tin, which still makes me smile as I go to sleep <laughs> thinking about it. But the dead body one, all these things, they were all very, very farcical elements, which weren't you know, sitcom at all. But that's why we love it, because it, he dared to be, you know, I don't care, I'm just going to make people roar with laughter. Wonderful. What happened with my episode is that uh, during series one, I had a copy of the actor's um, spotlight, which is like the directory, uh, with all the actors in the country, and John had one his end of the phone, and he would ring me and ask advice about casting, because he knew actors' face, he wasn't very good on names. So he'd say, well, I need somebody so-and-so next week, and, that was, and I'd look through, and I'd say, well, page 117, number three. He said, yes, that's it, he'll be ideal. We got into the second series, and he rang me a couple of, he said, he rang me out one day, he said, I've got a real problem. I've got a huge problem in a couple of weeks' time in the casting. I said, why? He said, there's a character in it, and I've never been so rude to, the to a character in anything I've ever done, Python or anything, as I am to this person, about what he looks like. I mean, I describe him as a monkey and stuff like that. And he said, unless it's somebody I know, I won't be able to do it. I'll be too embarrassed. And he said, actually, can I send you the script? Because I think you'd be rather good. So I, I read the script. I rang him out. He said, of course, I'd love to. It'd be great. And, um, and I have to say that when we rehearsed it for the five days, in those days you used to have a final run through the day before you went into the studio for all the technicians. And after it, I went up to John and I said, John, what am I going to do? He said, well, he said, I said, I've, I've never got through it without laughing. I cannot do this. It just makes me corpse. Everything, every time I look at you, I just laugh. He said, you'll be right tomorrow in front of an audience. I said, why? He said, you just see the fear in my eyes. And it's absolutely true. He was absolutely terrified. And that kind of <laughs> pulled, pulled you together. Well, I mean, it's the most extraordinary complex and original character that I've ever run across <laughs> on television or anywhere else. And yet, incredibly real. Um, he's <laughs> the maddest man in the world. And yet there's a kind of logic about him with all sorts of extraordinary side. His character is made up of so many different ingredients He's so obsessed with being worried about sex or anything to do with anything slightly um, uncomfortable. Although he's raving mad and doesn't mind doing funny walks and all that. Incredibly sensitive in other areas and shy and raving mad. And he is the most wonderfully, um, he's the most wonderful physical actor as well, apart from the funny walk. Everything he has to do physically is just terribly funny and stylish. There must be a great mind thing in, in John Cleese, I think. But um, a, a lovely actor. And his character, I mean, is amazing. Was there ever another character like Basil Fawlty? I don't think so. Basil Fawlty is the funniest character ever to appear on television in any country on any continent funny and just marvelous just marvelous you could watch it forever <laughs>